First part of chapter 9 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Chapter 9. How Thought is Practical. Side note. Functional Relations of Mind and Body. Nothing is more natural or more congruous with all the analogies of experience than that animals should feel and think. The relation of mind to body, of reason to nature, seems to be actually this. When bodies have reached a certain complexity and vital equilibrium, a sense begins to inhabit them which is focused upon the preservation of that body and on its reproduction. This sense, as it becomes reflective and expressive of physical welfare, points more and more to its own persistence and harmony, and generates the life of reason. Nature is reason's basis and theme. Reason is nature's consciousness, and, from the point of view of that consciousness when it has arisen, reason is also nature's justification and goal. To separate things so closely bound together as our mind and body, reason and nature, is consequently a violent and artificial divorce, and a man of judgment will instinctively discredit any philosophy in which it is decreed. But to avoid divorce, it is well first to avoid unnatural unions, and not to attribute to our two elements, which must be partners for life, relations repugnant to their respective natures and offices. Now the body is an instrument, the mind its function, the witness and reward of its operation. Mind is the body's entelechy, a value which accrues to the body when it has reached a certain perfection, of which it would be a pity, so to speak, that it should remain unconscious, so that while the body feeds the mind, the mind perfects the body, lifting it and all its natural relations and impulses into the moral world, into the sphere of interests and ideas. No connection could be closer than this reciprocal involution, as nature and life reveal it. But the connection is natural, not dialectical. The union will be denaturalized and, so far as philosophy goes, actually destroyed, if we seek to carry it on into logical equivalence. If we isolate the terms mind and body and study the inward implications of each apart, we shall never discover the other. That matter cannot, by transposition of its particles, become what we call consciousness is an admitted truth. That mind cannot become its own occasions or determine its own march, though it be a truth not recognized by all philosophers, is in itself no less obvious. Matter, dialectically studied, makes consciousness seem a superfluous and unaccountable addendum. Mind, studied in the same way, makes nature an embarrassing idea, a figment which ought to be subservient to conscious aims and perfectly transparent, but which remains opaque and overwhelming. In order to escape these sophistications, it suffices to revert to immediate observation and state the question in its proper terms. Nature lives, and perception is a private echo and response to ambient motions. The soul is the voice of the body's interest. In watching them a man defines the world that sustains him and that conditions all his satisfactions. In discerning his origin, he christens nature by the eloquent name of mother, under which title she enters the universe of discourse. Simultaneously, he discerns his own existence and marks off the inner region of his dreams, and it behooves him not to obliterate these discoveries. 
by trying to give his mind false points of attachment in nature he would disfigure not only nature but also that reason which is so much the essence of his life side note they form one natural life consciousness then is the expression of bodily life and the seat of all its values its place in the natural world is like that of its own ideal products art religion or science it translates natural relations into synthetic and ideal symbols by which things are interpreted with reference to the interests of the consciousness itself this representation is also in existence and has its place along with all other existences in the bosom of nature if the word cause did not suggest dialectical bonds we might innocently say that thought was a link in the chain of natural causes it is at least a link in the chain of natural events for it has determinate antecedents in the brain and senses and determinate consequence in actions and words but this dependence and this efficacy have nothing logical about them they are habitual collocations in the world like lightning and thunder a more minute inspection of psychophysical processes were it practicable would doubtless disclose undreamed of complexities and harmonies in them the mathematical and dynamic relations of stimulus and sensation might perhaps be formulated with precision but the terms used in the equation their quality and inward habit would always remain data which the naturalist would have to assume after having learned them by inspection movement could never be deduced dialectically or graphically from thought nor thought from movement indeed no natural relation is in a different case neither gravity nor chemical reaction nor life and reproduction nor time space and motion themselves are logically deducible nor intelligible in terms of their limits the phenomena have to be accepted at their face value and allowed to retain a certain empirical complexity otherwise the seed of all science is sterilized and calculation cannot proceed for want of discernible and pregnant elements how fine nature's habit may be where repetition begins and down to what depth of mathematical treatment can penetrate is a question for the natural sciences to solve whether consciousness for instance accompanies vegetative life or even all motion is a point to be decided solely by empirical analogy when the exact physical conditions of thought are discovered in man we may infer how far thought is diffused through the universe for it will be coextensive with the conditions it will have been shown to have now in a very rough way we know already what these conditions are they are first the existence of an organic body and then its possession of adaptable instincts of instincts that can be modified by experience this capacity is what an observer calls intelligence docility is the observable half of reason when an animal winces at a blow and readjusts his pose we say he feels and we say he thinks when we see him brooding over his impressions and find him launching into a new course of action after a silent decoction of his potential impulses conversely when observation covers both the mental and the physical process that is in our own experience we find that felt impulses the conceived objects for which they make and the values they determine are all correlated with animal instincts and external impressions a desire is the inward sign of a physical proclivity to act an image in sense is the sign in most cases of some material object in the environment and always we may presume 
of some cerebral change. The brain seems to simmer like a cauldron in which all sorts of matters are perpetually transforming themselves into all sorts of shapes. When this cerebral reorganization is pertinent to the external situation and renders the man, when he resumes action, more a master of his world, the accompanying thought is said to be practical, for it brings a consciousness of power and an earnest of success. Cerebral processes are, of course, largely hypothetical. Theory suggests their existence, and experience can verify that theory only in an indirect and imperfect manner. The addition of a physical substratum to all thinking is only a scientific expedient, a hypothesis expressing the faith that nature is mechanically intelligible, even beyond the reaches of minute verification. The addition of a physical substratum to all thinking is only a scientific expedient, a hypothesis expressing the faith that nature is mechanically intelligible even beyond the reaches of minute verification. The accompanying consciousness, on the other hand, is something intimately felt by each man in his own person. It is a portion of crude and immediate experience that it accompanies changes in his body and in the world is not an inference for him but a datum but when crude experience is somewhat refined and the soul at first mingled with every image finds that it inhabits only her private body to whose fortunes hers are altogether wedded we begin to imagine that we know the cosmos at large better than the spirit for beyond the narrow limits of our own person only the material face of things is open to our observation. To add a mental face to every part and motion of the cosmos is then seen to be an audacious fancy. It violates all empirical analogy, for the phenomenon which feeling accompanies in crude experience is not mere material existence, but reactive organization and docility. Side note. Artifices involved in separating them. The limits set to observation, however, render the mental and material spheres far from coincident, and even in a rough way mutually supplementary, so that human reflection has fallen into a habit of interlarding them. The world, instead of being a living body, a natural system with moral functions has seemed to be a bisectable hybrid, half material and half mental, the clumsy conjunction of an automaton with a ghost. These faces, taken in their abstraction as they first forced themselves on human attention, have been taken for independent and separable facts. Experience remaining in both provinces quite sensuous and superficial, has accordingly been allowed to link this purely mental event with that purely mechanical one. The linkage is practically not deceptive, because mental transformations are indeed signs of changes in bodies. And so long as a cause is defined merely as a sign, mental and physical changes may truly be said to cause one another, but so soon as this form of augury tries to overcome its crude empiricism and to establish phenomenal laws, the mental factor has to fall out of the efficient process and be represented there by what, upon accurate examination, it is seen to be really the sign of, I mean by some physiological event. If philosophers of the Cartesian school had taken to heart, as the German transcendentalists did, the cogito ergo sum of their master, and had considered that a physical world is, for knowledge, nothing but an instrument to explain sensations and their order, they might have expected this collapse of half their metaphysics at the approach of their positive science. For if mental existence was to be kept standing only by its supposed causal efficacy, nothing could prevent the whole world from becoming presently a 
bet machine psychic events have no links save through their organs and their objects the function of the material is indeed precisely to supply their linkage the internal relations of ideas on the other hand are dialectical their realm is eternal and absolutely irrelevant to the march of events if we must speak therefore of causal relations between mind and body we should say that matter is the pervasive cause of mind's distribution and mind the pervasive cause of matter's discovery and value to ask for an efficient cause to trace back a force or investigate origins is to have already turned one's face in the direction of matter and mechanical laws no success in that undertaking can fail to be a triumph for materialism to ask for a justification on the other hand is to turn no less resolutely in the direction of ideal results and actualities from which instrumentality and further use have been eliminated spirit is useless being the end of things but it is not vain since it alone rescues all else from vanity it is called practical when it is prophetic of its own better fulfilments which is the case whenever forces are being turned to good uses whenever an organism is exploring its relations and putting forth new tentacles with which to grasp the world End of chapter 9, part 1